When you study the Old Testament, you realize that the nation of Persia figures kind of prominently in a number of different places. Um, in, um, uh, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon has a dream where uh, he sees an image of a number of different metals, gold, uh, silver, bronze, uh, iron, and then iron mixed with clay. The head of gold represents Babylon, and uh, as Daniel interprets the dream, uh, and not only interprets the dream, but tells Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was in the first place, but then he interprets it and explains to Nebuchadnezzar that the head of gold is representative of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And uh, in the second kingdom, the uh, chest and arms of silver are going to uh, ultimately uh, represent Persia or Medo-Persia. And that kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom, would one day overthrow Babylon. Then they would be overthrown by the Greeks, and then they would be overthrown by the Romans. And so uh, you can read about this in Daniel chapter 2, and you can read a similar uh, um, uh, vision, if you will, that's given directly to Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. Although the imagery is different, the message is fundamentally the same. Uh, but anyway, getting back to the immediate, um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar does, uh, does not want this to happen, and Daniel chapter 3 explains what he does in rebellion against what God has revealed to him. But nevertheless, um, the uh, southern two tribes of Israel, known as Judah, are currently under captivity in Babylon. But as Daniel interprets for Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar's dream says, Babylon is ultimately then overthrown by the Medo-Persians. And it is under the Persian uh, rule that the deportation of the Jews back to Judah ultimately begins to take place. Three waves ultimately, two of which are recorded in Ezra, and the third is recorded in Nehemiah. And so we see uh, Persia mentioned there prominently in regard to their interaction and even control over Judah. As a matter of fact, um, if I understand tradition correctly, Daniel took a reference from Isaiah chapter 45 and showed it to Cyrus, and that is what ultimately um, was the catalyst for the uh, beginning of the deportation of the Jews back to their homeland. What's so special about Isaiah 45? Well, Cyrus the Persian is called out by name by God himself before Cyrus was ever in control. And so this obviously has an impact on Cyrus when he sees his name in print by the God of the Hebrews, uh, who ultimately mentions him by name. Uh, we also recognize uh, Persia as being uh, present in the battle described by Ezekiel the prophet. Um, and this is uh, in, in regard to the hordes that come against Israel, um, led by uh, a land called Magog, which uh, some hold to be Russia, some hold to be Turkey, others uh, have differing views, but generally Russia and Turkey are the two prime contenders for who's in view in that passage. Um, but in any case, Persia is mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 5, as being part of that event, an event that I personally believe has yet to take place and that I think will soon take place in uh, precipitation then of Daniel's 70th week, which is the last seven-year period of man's rule on the earth before the return of Christ. Now, why do we talk about Persia? Because we know Persia under a different name today, and if in fact the events of Ezekiel 38 and 39 are, are yet future to us, and maybe even soon coming, uh, as I believe they are, then it would behoove us to wonder, well, who's in view when we see these nations named? And when we see Persia, we are actually today talking about the land of Iran. So what happens in Iran is of interest to us in terms of biblical prophecy, because that is who's in view in places like Ezekiel 38. Now, a couple of months ago, uh, in May, we did a post after the death of uh, Iranian President Ibrahim uh, Raisi, who died in a helicopter crash. And uh, some reports that have come out since then have said that there was no foul play. It was just an accident and he died in it. Uh, that could very well be. There, if there's anything else in view, we don't really know that for sure. But it did ultimately lead to an election that just took place uh, very, very recently over the weekend, actually, uh, where now Iran has a new president, and this is a man named Masoud uh, Pazeshkian. I want to I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, Masoud Pazeshkian. And uh, when, in the previous post, we talked about the implications of the death of Ibrahim Raisi. And essentially, in that post, we said that the implications have yet to be seen. Uh, Ibrahim Raisi was a, uh, is, was a protege of Ayatollah Khamenei. He was somebody who 
um, was pretty much lockstep in, in, in many respects uh, with uh, the supreme leader's uh, worldview and such. The new president is in some ways the same way, but in other ways he is seen as something of a moderate. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Pazeshkian is not somebody who has any lineage that would sort of put him in line to any capacity governmentally. He just is an average person, apparently, uh, among uh, the Iranians. Who was a uh, he was a cardiac surgeon. He did ultimately serve, uh, and 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 up until recently was serving in the parliament in Iran, previously as a health minister. Um, but he is seen as a moderate because of the way that he campaigned. Uh, he was kind of a long shot, not somebody that anyone really expected even to run uh, or, or to be allowed to run, much less win. Uh, he made statements about wanting to uh, sort of lighten the restrictions on things like the internet and make uh, the internet more available for people. He uh, spoke about maybe lightening the restrictions in regard to head coverings and that among the women in Iran. And so uh, he is, uh, again, seen as somewhat moderate in that regard, and some even call him a reformer. Um, but that being said, he is very much in lockstep with uh, Khomeini in, in regard to his international views to some extent, in some areas. In other ways, he maybe broadens his uh, scope a little bit. Um, uh, he has uh, spoken openly about his belief that there needs to be better relationship with the West in order for Iran to uh, do well, to, to prosper and such. And so he is a, a proponent of going back to the, uh, the, the nuclear treaty, the JCPOA. Uh, he is somebody who, on the one hand, uh, is sort of, again, moderate. On the other hand, in regard to Israel, he has taken a hard line, uh, like Khomeini, uh, in regard to maybe being open to negotiations with, with many nations, however not with Israel. And now that may be a true feeling on his part, or it may be the fact that you have to say that to get uh, to be vetted and counted as, as uh, um, uh, worthy to run for election in that country. It's probably worth taking a minute to talk about that aspect of, of uh, you wouldn't call it democracy, but you could call it uh, elections at least. Uh, sort of. But in Iran, um, only about half, maybe even less than half of eligible voters in Iran even voted in the election. And in the election, um, uh, 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 Pazeshkian actually defeated a very staunch conservative or somewhat hardline uh, opponent, uh, Jalil, who, uh, who got 45% of the vote, and uh, or 41 or 45 percent of the vote, and then uh, Pazeshkian got uh, like 51 percent of the vote. So he won by about 10 points. Um, although he won by 10 points over an electorate that only about half of them showed up. And so there's a general sense, and I think it's probably very true, that um, uh, based on the vetting process for who even gets to run in Iran, uh, something that uh, is always going to be subject to the Supreme Leader's um, uh, you know, uh, input. Um, but, uh, you know, the, most people in Iran, the average citizen, does not seem to think really that their vote means a lot. Uh, they're voting for somebody who maybe they like better than another candidate, but still somebody who the Ayatollah is essentially allowed to run. And so uh, if this person was truly a moderate or truly a different kind of a candidate, um, he probably would not have been able to run. The fact that the Ayatollah has okayed it or has essentially um, put a stamp on the vetting process means that probably this candidate is not so far removed in many respects from uh, where the where Khomeini is. And so uh, you will hear often and are already hearing if you're following any of this that um, he they call him a moderate, they think of him as a reformer, he's somebody who's going to on a societal level bring change to Iran. That may be to some degree. Time will tell. We'll see. Once he's installed and begins to have sway over uh, the political system there in, um, in Iran, then we'll see what, if any, effect his election uh, will have upon life in Iran for the average citizen. However, in terms of international politics, it is very unlikely that he will have any real sway over the direction that Iran takes. Uh, and certainly in regard for our purposes uh, with Israel in that, 
uh, there is likely not going to be any change in posture uh, of Iran in regard to Israel. And so um, in the previous post uh, a couple of months ago, we basically left it at, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, will, will the person who's elected be a hardliner? Will they be less so? Will they actually have any impact or not? We don't really know. Now we know who's been elected and we have an idea about what he's about to some degree, but we don't really know what that's going to look like. However, it would appear that by and large on the international stage, uh, at least in terms of the more controversial kinds of issues, uh, it is unlikely that there will be a whole lot of change in Iran's um, posture in the days ahead uh, in, in regard to much. So that being said, my expectation, and I could be wrong, we'll wait and see what happens. Maybe uh, some perfect storm will take place in Iran where suddenly a very moderate wave takes over and attitudes and mindsets change. Um, I, I don't expect that, really. Um, I, I think if the Ayatollah died and all of a sudden there was a power grab of some kind, the people might feel emboldened to rise up and, and back somebody who they uh, believe will bring real change and bring Iran into the 21st century and such. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, stranger things have happened in the world. But we want to remember that the Bible does tell us, God's revelation to us in regard to the last days does describe Persia in a particular way, and that is siding with uh, again, whether it's Russia or Turkey, and there's reason to, you know, kind of uh, take either one of those uh, um, uh, views. But whoever uh, it is, Persia comes along with them and comes up against Israel, which has ramifications, uh, not only in terms of Israel's defending herself, but in terms of heaven invading earth. God is going to ultimately intervene on behalf of Israel. And you see that very, very strongly in Ezekiel 38 and 39, if you're familiar with the passage, if you're not, let me encourage you to become familiar with it because those are events we will be seeing take place in the relatively near future, I believe. But uh, there is mentioned a number of times, I think five times, where God says that he is doing these things so that they, they being both his people and also the surrounding nations who are attacking his people, that they may know that I am the Lord. So when it comes to understanding what's in view in those chapters, on the one hand, one might think, okay, well, some of the things that are described sound like nuclear weapons or things like that, and that may be partially what's going on, but it does seem as though God is making it clear, and he's going to make sure that it's clear that he's in fact the one who is defending Israel in that conflict. So uh, is that conflict any less likely to take place now that a new president has been elected in Iran? I personally don't think so. I personally don't think we're going to see much of a change. I don't think this changes the direction of much of anything. Um, my expectation was that a far more hardline candidate was going to ultimately win the election and uh, things might become even more amped up as a result of that. Um, I still personally feel as though it is likely that uh, things will amp up, but there may be some societal um, you know, sort of throwing the people a bone kind of a thing. That might be what's, um, you know, what's kind of in view in electing this particular candidate. Maybe he'll give the people a little bit of breathing room uh, so that there's less resistance and rebellion against the leadership. As every now and then, uh, there is there there are people who uh, who make their voices heard in uh, in defiance of of, uh, of Khomeini and, and the government and that kind of thing. Uh, it may very well be that he's sort of placating the people for a time. Uh, while his actual plans uh, uh, continue. And so uh, anyway, just, uh, you know, I I, I, uh, I I try not to take too, go too far on what to expect in these things because time will tell. But I do think it's important to take a look at what's going on and be uh, abreast of what's happening so that we can piece these things together as, as further things unfold. Uh, I am fully expecting what Ezekiel describes in these chapters to take place uh, in the not too distant future. Um, we've often seen uh, three or four times in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, three, I think three times that I can remember where, uh, where events have escalated so dramatically. And of course, with the, the current conflict between Israel and Hamas, uh, who by the way, uh, uh, Pazeshkin uh, is in full support of Hezbollah and Hamas and the uh, Iranian Republican Guard. He's not critical in any way of the course of action uh, against Israel in this war uh, with uh, Hamas and such. So, uh, but in any case, I, I, there, there is always 
and sometimes even more than others, uh, seemingly a finger on the trigger, ready to pull the trigger so that this, um, this scenario unfolds. I don't think this election really changes that at all. Uh, it may, again, just last thought, it may, again, kind of placate public sentiment within Iran, and even globally, it may sort of make Iran uh, seem more attractive of, an, of a country to do business with since maybe now they have a negotiating partner in terms of um, easing sanctions or opening up commerce and trade and that kind of thing. There are possibly those sorts of things that I think could happen and those could have implications on the global stage. Uh, but in terms of what the Bible tells us particularly and specifically about uh, Persia and her place in uh, some of these events taking place. I don't think much has really changed uh, to to uh, to even maybe even slow that down. We'll find out in the days ahead, though. I would just keep your eye on the Bible, of course, first and foremost, and then look at what's going on in the world around through that lens, and um, and we'll just watch and see what happens, how things unfold. But we do know the grand architect of all things. That is, uh, uh, I hate to use that term and sound like I'm trying to be a mason or something. I'm not. It just, uh, but the one who ultimately is. Uh, moving the course of history toward the uh, predetermined end that he has described in Scripture, where ultimately all the nations of the earth become, the kingdoms of the earth become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. That continues to move as God has designed. And so this is all part of that. So just keep uh, Israel in prayer. Uh, be praying for America as a democratic partner with Israel for the time being. Um, it's hard to really say that we are blessing Israel, but we're not fully cursing them. We're sort of in this middle-ish kind of area that uh, could change one way or the other in the upcoming elections here in November. So, um, uh, but that's a, that's a topic for another time. So thanks for watching and listening and uh, give me a few minutes. And uh, uh, this, as always, is intended to be food for thought. Hopefully you'll do a little research on your own. And, uh, and most of all, though, let me encourage you to look to the scripture and to, uh, um, and to let that be your guide in understanding what's going on in the world around us. Father, we thank you for giving us time to consider these things and giving us eyes to see and ears to hear. Uh, we pray that, Father, you would help us as students of scripture, and especially for those of us who are students of prophecy, not to jump the gun or go too far uh, in our estimations of how things are going to pan out or when or all that kind of thing, but help us to stick to what your word has to say, because we know we're standing on solid ground when we do that. Some of the details may get filled in or may be still blurry and that kind of thing, but we do know how the story ends. We do know the things that are coming, and uh, we do know ultimately that um, that these things are all going according to the plans and purposes that you've described, whether it's, uh, whether it's Ezekiel 38 or whether it's Revelation uh, six and on, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, whatever events in between. We just pray that, Father, you would help us as students of your word to seek your face and to pray on behalf of those we love, that we might have an opportunity with the gospel, that we might pray on behalf of your people Israel, and for the peace of Jerusalem, as you've told us to pray. We pray that we would be engaged in your purposes as they continue to unfold again toward that predetermined end. Uh, we thank you that there's no doubt and no question as to the fact that you will bring all things together and 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 to a culmination as you've said. Uh, so, Father, for our part, help us to be about your business as you bring these things forward. Thank you, Father. You're good. You're awesome. You are in control. You are our all in all. Uh, you're the you're the hand that moves history. You are the uh, the omniscient one who knows all things. You're the sovereign one who drives history in the direction that you are ultimately leading it to. You give us rest and peace because you're the cleft of the rock. We know we have no reason to be afraid because you are the one who's in control. Jesus did say that in this world, even though we will have tribulation, we can be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. And so with that, we say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Come quickly, Lord. Thank you, Father. We just praise you and we bless you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.